morning and thanks for, for coming for today, today panel, which is dedicated for you know, transparency and uh, accountability of uh, the post-war reconstruction recovery of Ukraine. We have a very interesting panel today and panelists. Uh, and just let me maybe add a few words uh, before we start. Uh, um, there was a recent statement uh, in the uh, German Marshall Fund report about the reconstruction of Ukraine that uh, Ukrainian reconstruction will be a Herculean task, so it will be very, very difficult, very big. Uh, and uh, the magnitude of the problems which uh, the Russian invasion uh, actually made for Ukraine uh, are enormous. And uh, I would say probably uh, unprecedented in the uh, in the modern history, even if we clearly understand there are other conflicts in the, in the world. Uh, and um, as a result of that, uh, of, the, of these uh, huge, uh, huge challenges and the huge problems which Ukraine currently has, I think uh, that um, the, there is no single institution which uh, either national, I mean the country, or the international, like you know, World Bank, IMF, or others, uh, can handle the Ukrainian reconstruction single-handedly. And uh, considering also that this uh, very challenging task uh, to the, and pretty um, unprecedented in the, in the modern times, I think also that there are the, the instruments or the institutions in general which, were, uh, which can tackle, which can manage it, uh, uh, maybe there is not necessary that they exist. Uh, maybe we can, we should develop new institutions, maybe we need to, to develop the new instruments and we need to be brave, uh, as also Ukrainians do, you know, in order to, uh, you know, to help Ukraine uh, with the uh, reconstruction. And um, mm, I strongly believe that uh, um, extraordinary challenges which Ukraine ma meets, uh, you know, require also extraordinary policies. Uh, you know, in the country and outside of the, uh, and the country. And my idea today is to discuss uh, this, uh, you know, the reconstruction of Ukraine, post-war reconstruction of Ukraine from three specific angles. You know, the first one is uh, how the Ukrainian recovery and reconstruction architecture may look like. You know, it will be interesting to hear the, the opinions of the, of, the, of the colleagues. Second is uh, where to take, uh, you know, money you know, for the reconstruction, where they will come from. And clearly, the focus of this conference in general is uh, how to build the accountability and transparency around uh, the reconstruction in order that this money would be spent efficiently uh, and uh, not wasted, uh, which is, as I said, is a key topic for the, for the conference itself. And let me introduce uh, our you know, honorable panelists today. We have Alexandra Zarkina, you know, Deputy Minister of Infrastructure, Ukraine, Infrastructure and Regional Development uh, now. You know, uh, we have Andrei Borovik, Executive Director of Transparency International uh, in Ukraine. Viktor Nistulia, Head of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the Open Contracting Partnership and Head of Board of the RICE Ukraine Coalition. Uh, we have John Sopko, he is a Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, or his name SIGAR. Uh, and uh, Ekat Kishalashvili, uh, you know, Chief of Party of the USAID Support uh, uh, to Anti-Corruption Champion Institutions Program in Ukraine or such. You know, we have an excellent pan uh, panel today and uh, let's uh, maybe start focusing on the, on the first element of the, of the reconstruction uh, architecture. And uh, so I want to ask our, you know, probably Ukrainian panelists and I perceive Eka is as Ukrainian here, you know, on, the, on, the, on this panel, you know, of uh, your view, how you see the, the potential architecture for, for reconstruction, and later maybe I will ask John to, to reflect on these, uh, on these thoughts uh, and to share his ideas uh, of the experience in Afghanistan uh, on them. So, let's start with you, Alexander, you know. How do you personally see, or institutionally in the ministry, see the reconstruction architecture? And what elements we already have, or what we should have? And uh, what instruments uh, or institutions we really need to, to build, uh, you know, according to your view? Thanks. Thank you very much. So, yeah, just recently, um, the Minister of Infrastructure merged with the Minister of Regional Development and Communities. It's a huge job 
but it's the right moment for that because at the moment we're going to be the key responsible body for the reconstruction. And it's the best what we can imagine for the proper planning. First of all, uh, when we started the discussions about the future architecture of the reconstruction, my minister, Alexandru Kubrakov, he always was saying, we need outsourcing that. Really meaning that we need to make sure that we're going to balance between the interest of the Ukraine in a whole, the decentralization, and the proper possibility to make sure that all risks are mitigated and somehow all our partners are involved. And frankly speaking, the easiest solution at the moment we found is a World Bank Trust Fund. We checked all books provided by World Bank. We checked all their experience they had, especially after the wars and conflicts in different continents. And that's about <coughs> institutions. And that was the key for us to start negotiating about that. But of course, we understand there are different discussions, there are different global interests, and for sure not all countries will be interested to use only like a World Bank trust fund. So for these reasons, Ukraine need to be open for all kind of help. How to manage that when we, we, at the beginning we already have different approaches? It all starts with data management. So basically, we started with uh, doing two things. First, we built the register for damaged property. Thanks to the fact that Ukraine is a very digitalized country, we already have a tool on our phones to apply directly to the state if something happened to your property, house, school, anything. And the data collected for this application is official. So it's going to be used for the future in the courts, for the reparation, for everything. That's just the start. Then, together with our partners from Rise Ukraine, we started discussions and already conceptualized the idea of the digital management of the reconstruction. And there, the thing which we already understand how it's going to work, that's the access for all donors to the whole portfolio of the projects in Ukraine with a possibility to make sure that nothing is overlapped, that if someone already claimed to build, rebuild this or this facility, no one else will go there. Or just probably, you know, send additional 100 millions, for example. So we really need to be here more open and creative. And to make sure that there wouldn't be any chaotic movements, just enlisted everything. And that's the basis. Thanks a lot, and um, I, I fully agree you with uh, uh, this. Is what I say to the to different colleagues, uh, uh, both in IMF and in other institutions, both in Washington and in Europe, uh, that uh, with all our empathy to other wars uh, and all other conflicts, which clearly we also share the view that the peace should prevail in the world, uh, the war in Ukraine and the invasion of Russia to Ukraine is slightly different because comparing to other you know, the, the conflicts and wars, Ukraine is a very developed country, and including the digitalized country, and the, these sh may substantially help us uh, to overcome uh, the, the potential problems which other countries, uh, including in Afghanistan probably, but also Iraq and uh, in other countries, which help us. Eka, uh, if I may ask you, uh, do, you know, do you agree with the uh, with, uh, with minister? Do you, uh, what, what other solutions, ideas uh, you have uh, uh, for the architecture, for recovery, you know, uh, reconstruction architecture, and uh, you know how this, uh, you know, architecture may reduce the corruption, but maybe also to increase the corruption, unfortunately. Sure. Thank you, Vlad. Um, I'll actually echo and build on that what has been already mentioned, and it, I think it's very important for us to have a bit of a step back approach to to what we face now as a crisis in Ukraine in terms of you know, war and invasion, uh, an impact of that brutal invasion, and then just not to forget what you've said, that Ukraine has come along quite a bit when it comes to the development after the revolution of dignity. Ukraine is, is a country that has transformed in so many ways when it comes to the way it operates, not just the state institutions, by the way, at central and local level, but then the social fabric itself of the country. And if you look at it during the times of the war, there's no other testament than that, at that degree that could be 
expressed, showcased by any nation than ability to withstand Goliath as Russia is when it comes to the military invasion and to continue to be not only functioning country, but the country that inspires now so many other countries that democracies can actually win. They can win inside the wars of their own wars of against corruption and the need for transformation, but then the wars with the countries like Russia as well. And why is that important? It's the capacity of the state to pull off that huge Herculean task of reconstruction and rebuilding. And then by the state, I mean all of the constituent elements of the state. Civil society is a very important component of that. Local authorities, municipalities, mayors, and private business. We frequently forget the private business in our conversations, but the agility with which the private business withstood the invasion, including American companies that continue to work in Ukraine. They are not laying off anybody. Uh, the jobs are being continued. The way how private business from outside is helping Ukrainian including in digital field. So in that sense, my main appeal and takeaway to the audience here and those who might be watching us is this. You, this process uh, should be considered as a next step, leap forward of Ukraine's development per se. It's not a reconstruction in classical sense of that when there is a destroyed country, non non-functioning entity, so to say, and then somebody needs to come in collectively or individually and make it work, almost govern at some point. It's a completely different stage. Now, Ukraine is anchored very deeply with EU when it comes to the not only prospect, but assurance, I would really hope, for the membership in a very expedient period of time of the EU. This is a completely different stage of development for the country, and that anchor drives Ukraine into the next stage of internal transformation. Anything that will be seen as a process of components of the rebuilding and reconstruction <clears throat> needs to be looked through the prism how Ukraine strengthens from within with that process, how further Ukrainian institutions are being strengthened, and with that sense, how much inclusivity of that development ensures sustainability of economic growth ultimately. I come from a country that uh, went through that terrible process of being a victim of Russian invasion. Uh, I know on a much lesser scale when it comes to what reconstruction brings as a challenge to a country. For us at the time, overarching strategic goal was to bring back conditions for economic growth. And I think that's what we need to have in mind for Ukraine as well. Not classics, crisis-related situations that we faced in other countries, because it's really sui generis case. It's very different. How we bring conditions that generate trust and confidence for private businesses as well to come back and invest, and then lenders that we are investors. And in that sense, the sustainable uh, trust only comes when you trust the state in which is, you're going to invest and the economic environment. And for that to happen, we cannot substitute Ukrainian bodies. We need to strengthen them, assist them, maybe make some bodies hybrid for some time, like audit service of the country, uh, reform of the anti-monopoly committee, because at the end of the day, it's the changed mentality of decompartmentalizing anti-corruption. Anti-corruption needs to be part of everybody's work, so that reassurance that accountability and integrity will be an, uh, an integral component of the whole process. And then data management system definitely is part of it, but the maintaining the whole anti-corruption infrastructure, so both prevention and punishment for corruption actions, again, is uh, guaranteed in the country. That's, uh, that's something that we need to look at. Mindset that is very different from any other reconstruction and rebuilding processes, I would say. Thanks, Eka. And uh, I think, uh, I don't know, if, if I may do this uh, on behalf of the consolidated West, uh, if I'm a Ukrainian, you know, the, we need to apologize to the world uh, that the West did not respond properly to the invasion of, of Georgia in 2008. And we are paying also the price now for that as well. Uh, but uh, you're absolutely right, I fully agree that uh, Ukraine showed during the war as a fully functional state uh, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, in a few days uh, after the liberation of our cities, you know, the, the postal office already comes there, the banking is coming there, the, um, uh, you know, other services, uh, uh, the, the trains are starting there, they're starting coming there, 
And um, I think this shows that the Ukrainian government has a capacity, and I fully agree with you that we need uh, to develop the, the, the internal capacity for the, for the country. And uh, you, one thing which you didn't mention, uh, let's also not forget that Ukraine is a democratic state also. You know, that uh, it's not only that the government is has a capacity, but really we have a civil society, which is also very capable, which is clearly now some part of it focused on the volunteering and helping the army, but part of that, you know, like people like uh, Andrei, Viktor, and others, you know, they're helping also to build the, the reconstruction together with uh, Alexandra, as, uh, as she said, because it's a very it's a cl close cooperation with, uh, uh, with other institutions. Andrei, um, you know, Transpar Transparency International does a lot uh, in Ukraine uh, and did a lot in the last years and supported many anti-corruption in institutions uh, and also tracks the, the, the corruption perception in Ukraine. So, you know, my belief that uh, a big part of the perception of Ukraine as a corrupted state is a part of the Russian propaganda. Not saying that Ukraine, there is still a lot of things to do, you know, in this area, but still, uh, what is your view on the reconstruction architecture and what Ukraine has and what still needs to be built uh, in order to decrease also the perception of corruption? Um, actually, I have a few points. Uh, the first one is that we should divide like two different streams. One is immediate reconstruction, that's what the country needs like yesterday, because Russia is just ruining all the energy sector and many, many other sectors around the country. And another one, this is more strategic level, what, how we're gonna rebuild uh, or build back better, that's what we are uh, thinking every day about after our victory over the Russia. The thing about which Alexander was speaking, this is probably a good solution for now, for the needs which we need now, the trust fund of the World Bank and the one ministry, political responsibility in some way. Uh, so I, I don't think that in how much, like five months, what, what better can be invented, yeah? But yeah, I would concentrate on what can, how we need to prepare for this long-term reconstruction. Uh, because I'm, as Vlad said, I'm more pessimistic. I think that the full reconstruction of the country will take at least one generation, so at least 20 years, uh, because so many things need to be changed, not repaired, but absolutely changed. We need to build back better, and of course, uh, we need to think about this now. In comparison, lots of comparison between like discussions about reconstruction of Ukraine and Marshall's plan, which from my point of view is not appropriate because the world is absolutely different than it was in the 40s of 20th century. But even if going to back to, to the Marshall's plan, the discussions about it started in 1942 and the implementation only five years later. And we are talking about reconstruction only five months. We started with values uh, during the reconstruction conference in Lugano, and now there is a concrete solution that lead for the immediate needs, which uh, Sasha was just uh, speaking about. Uh, so there will be lots of these discussions, but what will be the key for the future reconstruction? We recently, today uh, in the morning, we published our vision of the concept of the future reconstruction, and one of the key parts is what actually about what Eka was calling. This is very like, popular world in Ukraine is reforms. That without doing the reforms now, continue doing the reforms now, it will be hard to be prepared for the future big reconstruction. We have a list, uh, and, but what, or what reforms we should do? Come on, we have like seven demands, conditionalities in order to start the full negotiations for the accession uh, to the EU. This can be already a guideline for, for us, and we should at least do those uh, seven, uh, six reforms which were mentioned uh, in the conditionalities. And of course, as Eka said, like we should every day think about the anti-corruption because the reconstruction, it's a huge money for the future. I, I just thought, uh, we were discussing in the team that for the last seven, eight years, national budget spending was about $200 billion. And the damage to the country, which was already done, the evaluation varies from like 200 to $600 billion. So it's like three times more than we spent through the national budget like for the last eight years. So it's just an in, unimaginable huge amount. And uh, what we see, we, we d decided that there should be uh, at least five elements, like five stages of the reconstruction. The first one is very simple, is a strategy. Without understanding what we're gonna do and why we're gonna do this, how we're gonna rebuild our cities, how we're gonna rebuild our, uh, make uh, them more 
um, better for the, for the communities, it will be very hard to uh, be successful. Because we look at the examples of the Bosnia and Herzegovina and, and uh, other countries, Afghanistan and, and many, many others. In, in Bosnia, for example, in Sarajevo, there was no proper planning of the city and now they have lots of the problems because it's very chaotic uh, buildings. And this is only one of the small examples. The second one is, of course, about the prioritization. We need to prioritize what we're going to do. Yeah, and a proper planning, exact planning, not the vision level, but the planning, exactly why we're doing this, why we're developing this. Are we really want to go back uh, for the country and rebuild those uh, uh, plants, which are some of our oligarchs lost at the east, or maybe want to uh, re re reorientate our economy for the services? So let's forget about that Soviet legacy and let's do something new. The third one is, of course, about uh, how uh, about tendering. So how are we going to spend it? We truly believe that Ukraine has the best public procurement system called Prozora. It's a very good IT product. This is not about the law and how it is happening. But we have lots of IT solutions, and I think we will talk about this later uh, today even more. Uh, and uh, the fourth stage is, of course, evaluation. We need constantly learning what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And if there is something wrong, and there is, will be definitely a room for improvement at every stage. Uh, but what is good about that, that while we will be implementing this immediate needs reconstruction, we already can start learning. So we will not need to you know, forecast or predict what's, what's, what, uh, what will be uh, the future consequences or obstacles, but we already can do this like in practice piloting different things, working together with the government. Um, and if we will do, we will go through all these stages, it's, it's very hard because there is now lots of questions. When you're talking about reconstruction projects, who will develop these projects? Uh, to which center they need to be applied? Uh, who will define their quality? Uh, who will control their implementation? Uh, how are we going to control their implementation? Because this is thousands and hundreds of thousands of the projects which need to be implemented. And some of these functions can be still delivered by the government, but maybe there will be needed a uh, separate institution like it was done in Indonesia uh, at some point in order for proper coordination. We were talking with Lod before that there is a, still a huge problem between international partners of Ukraine regarding the coordination. They, like donors, really hard for them to coordinate because of the number of different reasons. Some were technical, some were political. That's okay, but now we should talk and discuss with the partners as a state, as a civil society of Ukraine, how to improve it and being part of that. Thanks, uh, uh, Sasha. I wanted really to say want something. to f um, give a feedback. First of all, um, regarding the World Bank Trust Fund, it's really about long term. Um, and we are quite lucky because we have all key IFIs working in Ukraine for years, investing in capacity, investing in people. And frankly speaking, majority of plans are already written, especially uh, the job which we uh, delivered together with EBRD and World Bank regarding the key reforms, regarding the reconstruction, the overall planning. They already wrote us a lot of methodologies, which we already were adapting. So just it's basically very important to understand that the job we're doing now with the World Bank, it's not something new for Ukraine. It's the continuation. And all those planning are together with the reform processes. For sure, procurement, for sure, anti-corruption, for sure, all way to actually build proper quality management. And frankly speaking, when we're saying about anti-corruption now, I'm sharing the widest understanding of the anti-corruption, because everything what we're doing now should be anti-corruption. And the procurement is just one part of whole infrastructure project cycle where the risks are hidden. But in the digital system we're building now, we're starting with a prioritization because a lot of political corruption risks are sitting in there. So again, strategies are nothing. Strategies are pamphlets without data under them. That's why it's so important to collect the data not only about the damages, but also about the people movement, about business opportunities, about the real conditions for people to live there. And that's the starting point for the prioritization and planning. Then we're going to the design documentation. A lot of interesting opportunities for the corruptioners in there. Which type of the concrete gonna we choose for this 100 billion bridge? Which type of the solutions for the window protection? And everything like that. 
then very important thing, which we are introducing since 2019 in all infrastructure projects we are touching, is independent technical supervision. It's quite a new for Ukraine, which is quite normal for the world, but we finally changed the model when the state is the owner of the object, when the state is procures the services and state is checking the quality. We changed that and we really want total outsiders to be at the place and to be the most rigorous anti-corruptioners calculating the amount of the concrete at each meter. And another small thing I would like to um, underline, so when we're talking about digital management, it's just a tool. And unfortunately, in Ukraine, we had examples when digital tools were used against state interests. And at some Sasha, point... Let, let's yeah. use this uh, digital, you know, <laughs> a little bit later because we also have Victor to, okay, to, to explain that. I, you know, it's... I usually, when I moderate the, the session, I like the conflict, you know. <laughs> we need to have, because it's very difficult to, when everybody speaks about the same things and they agree on everything. At the same time, I should say that I agree with both, uh, now with uh, Andre and, uh, and Sasha, because, uh, I mean, first, uh, World Bank is an institution which is designed to help the countries also in these kind of situations. At the same time, we are indeed not in the Marshall Plan life uh, when uh, exactly the World Bank, IMF, EBRD, EIB, you know, even European Union have not been designed yet. Uh, and therefore, clearly, for the last 70 years, uh, you know, the, the full uh, architecture of the uh, global aid and the development aid and reconstruction aid and post-natural disaster aid uh, have been created and learning on a daily basis. Uh, and that's why, I mean, it will be very hard uh, to speak about only one avenue through the you know, the, um, for the account of the, um, uh, of, the, of the World Bank, even though I would love, uh, you know, to more coordinating, because IMF also has uh, some sort of multi-donor fund, we name it an administrative account, uh, which some countries uh, root money for that. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we, we need to understand clearly what, uh, what Andre said, the coordination is needed. Uh, how to do this coordination on a digitally, you know, people-wise, institutional-wise, this is a still we are discussing, and uh, you mentioned Lugana, but it has been discussed in the Berlin conference substantially, and um, my understanding it will be discussed next week on the Paris conference. Uh, 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 let, yeah. Very briefly, uh, honestly, I haven't felt the conflict yet. No, 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 it's, I, 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 I wanted to, to provoke the word, the uh, word conflict. I, 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 I have, like, nothing to add to what Sasha said. It's all true, I can confirm, yeah, everything what you're saying that this is right. Uh, and I agree that IT product is only instrument, yeah, and uh, even having lots of data may add the transparency in not solving the problem of corruption. There is, so lots of work need to be done for the prevention, but there is also uh, work on when the corruption actually happened, what we're going to do with this. This is a question to law enforcement and, and, and the judicial reform and judicial system in the country. Victor, you know, you have two different hats somehow because you are in open contracting, but also you are working on rights. What is your, you know, either of these two hats or both hats uh, view on the, on the architecture in Ukraine? Thanks. First of all, I, I love this discussion and I want to echo what everyone said. Uh, there are a lot of practical things. And by the way, most of you probably have some QR codes and leaflets that describe some ideas uh, of Rise Ukraine, Transparency International, on how we see the future architecture of uh, Ukrainian reconstruction, but I want to you know, focus on some fundamental things and sorry for uh, diving back to principles because we are talking about architecture and some practical stuff, but um, just a quick question, you know, how many of you have children? You can raise your hands, so pretty many people. Uh, I, I'm father of six years old daughter who dreams about Ukrainian victory and uh, you know, when we delivered the baby, she couldn't walk she couldn't talk, she could only eat, sleep, and something else that I will not mention in this room. Uh, but, you know, the first day she could hold the spoon herself, we were giving that spoon every day even though the whole kitchen was messed up. We have to invest in her so she could learn how to eat herself. Now she's uh, learning how to write, you know, she's learning how to read, and we're not doing it instead of her, right? We are supporting her with different mobile apps, with some papers and so on, 
And I'm sure when it comes to chemistry or mathematics, and if she doesn't understand something, I will not do her homework instead of her. I will support her. I will explain maybe some basic stuff to her, but it should be her own you are too optimistic. experience. <laughs> it, it should be, you know, I'm judging based I on I have older my, kids, so you're too optimistic. I'm judging how, I'm judging how my parents, uh, you know, grew up me. But generally, we have to invest in, in, in our children. We have to give them freedom to make their own mistakes. And once they can do something, we have to support them so say, they can improve themselves. You know, I, I think that it's a possible analogy with, with Ukraine. Ukraine is a pretty young country comparatively to, to the global order. And believe me, and you see already, that Ukraine knows and can do a lot of things. Maybe, maybe we make some mistakes. But it doesn't mean that if we make a mistake, we, you know, as uh, Western world, have to uh, do something instead of Ukraine. So I want to highlight the fundamental principle that Ukrainian reconstruction should be owned and implemented by Ukraine. As Andriy mentioned, uh, overall uh, spendings of, of Ukrainian public procurement uh, per year was around 25 to 30 billion US dollars by every particular institution in our country. Schools, hospitals, railways, road building agencies and so on. Damages and needs right now, uh, as of June last year, it was 350 billion. Now it's even, even more, much more, right? And uh, we understand that all the international support that will be coming, and Ukrainian, by the way, as well, uh, to rebuild Ukraine will be probably more than Ukrainian could spend before. If we are talking that some, you know, external institutions have to implement the reconstruction, conduct procurement for Ukraine, select contractors for Ukraine, develop projects for Ukraine, it will not work. Our institutions will not grow. It means that you are not giving your baby a spoon, you know, and you will uh, be feeding your, your kid for the whole life. It's not correct. So this is a fundamental thing. And I believe that we have to invest in decentralization. So we have to give freedom and opportunity for local levels to develop projects. Maybe at some point of time they will present us poor quality projects. But we have to support them. We have to increase that quality. And day by day, we have to grow the institutional capacity in Ukraine at every level, starting from local level to central government, which is pretty capable because we've, we've seen how railways have been working, how Ukrainian road agencies have been working, and so on. So it's, it's important. In, in terms of architecture, I really believe that, again, Ukrainian government can deal with uh, Ukrainian reconstruction. And when I'm talking about Ukrainian government, I mean uh, ministries, I mean accounting chamber, which is supreme uh, audit institution in Ukraine. I mean uh, anti-corruption infrastructure, anti-corruption bureau, anti-corruption uh, prevention center, anti-corruption court, and, and others. It's important to invest in those institutions. And as Eka mentioned, maybe during some period of time, uh, it will be you know, a joint exercise, so institutional uh, building and technical assistance from our partners from abroad, like GAO from US or now from, from UK, etc. Let's, let's do it, but we should not you know, remove the spoon uh, from our, our government. And yes, at some point of time, I believe we will need uh, some kind of an institution that will help to coordinate. But again, it might be a governmental institution. It's definitely not a you know, G7++ EU institution sitting somewhere not in Kiev, working instead of Ukrainians to, do, to develop and deliver the reconstruction. Thanks, Victor. If you allow me, I will use your analogy of the, of the family issues. Huh? Uh, you know, one day, uh, no, when, when I was younger, my father was telling me uh, that uh, Vlad, you are potentially a rich groom uh, or husband, you know. And so he was keeping saying that, and one day I had to tell him that, Father, I'm already four years married. <laughs> Ukraine is 31 and goes to the, say, 32, so it's not about the spoon. You know, Ukraine already learned how to take a spoon uh, and maybe even two 
from someone. Uh, so, I mean, there is something which we need to learn, which we need to unlearn, you know, and I think anti-corruption institutions and the architecture also for that. But I fully agree with you, the Ukrainian government is capable. I don't believe in any institution outside of Ukraine which could manage the reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, this should be owned by Ukrainians. But again, let's be open to, you know, for, uh, for other advices, lessons learned from other countries. And here we go to John. So, what would be your opinion, uh, you know, about the ideas of our colleagues and what we can learn, you know, maybe from Afghanistan? Reflection and the lessons. Th th thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I think this is an excellent panel. Um, I, I think that, my, let me just preface what I say by asking a question is, why is somebody from a, who's dealt for the last 12 years with Afghanistan on a panel talking about Ukraine reconstruction? That must be a question you're asking. Um, I did not walk into the wrong panel. Um, my little agency has spent the last 12 years probably doing more oversight, and we're just an oversight agency, uh, on uh, reconstruction in a war zone than any other U.S. government agency. So we have a little bit of expertise, not so much in Afghanistan, but on the problems that arise in doing a massive, over, massive reconstruction effort in a country. Now, let me preface by saying Afghanistan is not the same as the Ukraine. As you're hearing, the Ukraine is far more developed in a far better state than Afghanistan was. And one of the first things I really want to say is I'm here really to speak more to the donors in the audience than to the Ukrainians. Because what I've heard, I would have been so pleased to hear what these, uh, uh, the rest of the panel has said uh, 12 years ago in Afghanistan. They had no concept of what was going on. They had no control of what's going on. But regardless, there is a lot to learn from the experience in Afghanistan and a lot for you in the Ukraine to learn from our reports on how the donors view reconstruction. Because I would say, next to the Russians, your biggest problem is going to be the donors. Because you're going to be dealing with multilateral organizations, bilateral organizations, you're not just going to be dealing with the U.S. government and its multiple organizations. You're going to be dealing with the EU, with NATO, with all the NATO countries, with the United States, with USAID, Department of Defense, Department of Transportation, FAA, you name it. It's whole of government and whole of governments that you, poor Ukraine, are going to have to deal with. Because we, the donors, approach this a little differently than you. And keep that in mind, and I would highly recommend, and we have a series of 20 lessons learned reports from Afghanistan, don't get hooked around the wheel that this is only relevant to Afghanistan. We weren't looking at Afghanistan, we were looking at the donors working in Afghanistan. And one of the things you're going to have a problem with, and, and I hope you work a deal out with the trust funds. The biggest problem is getting access to the records of the trust funds. We had to fight tooth and nail, almost threatening to subpoena the World Bank, to get access to the uh, 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 oversight and to the contracting records of the World Bank. We had the same threats we had to make to the UN and the NATO. And each one of these organizations have their own auditing function. They each have their own oversight function. They're monitoring and evaluation. You need access or somebody needs access to all of those books and records. So let me just back up. I think it's fantastic what you're doing because you're hitting some of the key problems. Key problem is you're getting too much money probably too fast, although you need a lot of it right now for the war fighting. 
But the big problem is going to happen when the, the shooting stops. Because then every agency in the US government, the EU, NATO, whatever, is going to want to have a piece of the Ukraine. So you really have to fight to make certain that you don't have two hospitals right next to each other, or six roads going in opposite directions, or somebody comes out with a nifty idea in Washington or Brussels that, gee, you know, you, you need uh, hydrogen uh, electric vehicles, not other things. You're going to have to fight tooth and nail to control, and, and these are all people with good intention. And these are all people who have to go back to their Congress or their Parliament to show success. And their timeline for success, if you read our reports, and this was a major problem in Afghanistan, their timeline for success has nothing to do with the reality on the ground. You got a congressional race coming up, they're going to have to show success. You have parliamentary elections, they're going to have to show success in a six month, one year, two year time frame. So keep that in mind, donors. You should be reading the lessons learned reports to help Ukraine work their way out of this horrible situation dealing with the Russians. So that's just my key thing. Thanks. Uh, I, 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 um, I, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a great, great intervention, and uh, you, it's a good also the, the bridge to the to the second part of the uh, of the discussion. Uh, but uh, what you just said, uh, especially about this, uh, that the timeline of donors is not linked with the needs of Ukraine. Uh, uh, this is exactly, you know, to the discussion also about what Victor said, also about the, the institutions and the government capacity, you know, and what Andre said about the generational issue. The problem is. Uh, Reconstruction will, be, will go through several political cycles, uh, not only in Ukraine, but also in the world. And therefore, we need to assure that the political you know, challenges, Ukraine is a democratic country, we don't know who is our next president, who is our next prime minister, thanks God. You know? And uh, that's why we, don't need to, we need to avoid that uh, you know, changes in the US administration or changes in European administrations, uh, you know, the, or, you know, the political will of people uh, or political thoughts of the people in Denmark uh, would uh, stop, uh, for example, the reconstruction in Ukraine. You know, and that's why we need to, to, to make sure that uh, we will come there. Let's go to the, to the, to the part of the, of the financing. And again, what, what John just said, uh, let's look at this also from the supply and demand side if, side if possible. Because again, I believe that a big part of inefficiencies uh, may also come from supply side. You know, and not, not necessarily in Ukraine, which really seeks for, for money in Ukraine. But we will have clearly many different avenues, as uh, Andre said, as John said now. We'll have national governments, we'll have multinational institutions, we'll have development banks, we will have business philanthropy, we will have donations, uh, we'll have private investments. Uh, and uh, we'll have also the, the reparations one day, for sure. You know, and uh, how, to, wh how to do it, uh, how, what we need to do in order, you know, to, I mean, to decrease to close to zero, you know, the misappropriation of these funds. And Victor, let's start with you. You know, I mean, uh, let's select uh, really randomly, you know, the, let's go with you with uh, development institutions, you know, development banks. Uh, tomorrow we meet with, uh, with IMF team, uh, you know, with many of the organizations and, uh, um, you know, IMF, World Bank, uh, development banks. What, how should we decrease? Here probably the supply side is less, you know, problems, but still, on the supply and demand side, how we need to decrease the corruption potential? That's a very good question. And actually, yesterday we had a very good meeting with the World Bank. And we were talking about transparency of Ukrainian reconstruction and transparency of World Bank fund. And in Ukrainian case, World Bank is now really um, working hard to make sure that Ukrainian Prozoro public procurement system is used for World Bank financed projects. So if you are not aware what Prozoro is, from Ukrainian it's translated as transparently, but uh, me as uh, part of open contracting partnership working with public procurement globally, I have, can, can easily admit that Ukrainian public procurement is the most transparent procurement system in the world, where you can see 
any uh, I know, specification, every document submitted by bidders, every bid, beneficiary owners of every bidder, uh, unit prices, contract signed itself with terms of the contract and specification inside of that contract. So the level of transparency is enormous, although it doesn't guarantee you know, uh, integrity and accountability, we, we know that. But generally, World Bank is now serious about using Prozoro. Uh, Prozoro is now under improvements, let's say, to meet the MDB's requirements, including EIB, including EBRD, and others MDBs, uh, to, to be able to use Prozoro system uh, with their procurement procedures, right? I believe that transparency of procurement here will help a lot to reduce corruption risks on the on uh, demand side. And uh, it would be great to talk about just, uh, just corruption, but I, I believe that it will be about mismanagement, uh, low capacity and, and corruption. About two hospitals and six roads. E e yeah. Exactly. For that, uh, we are now working together with multilaterals as well, in close cooperation with the World Bank, with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, under ministry uh, leadership. We are working on digital reconstruction management system, in which we are actually embedding requirements of uh, multilaterals. So all the pipelines of future projects will be following, for example, World Bank procedures from the very beginning and the principle how Minister Kubrakov stated when uh, the government resolution on this system was adopted, he stated that it will be a system that follows everyone sees everything principle. It's system open by design, so we will have open access to all information, every particular project at every stage, starting from prioritization to actually commissioning, understanding what challenges are happening even during the implementation stage, right? And um, eventually, anti-corruption of Ukrainian reconstruction will not be just an exercise of Ukrainians or institutions that are working in Ukraine, but also every one of you, you know, you will be able to use the system uh, to see how your taxpayers' uh, money are spent in Ukraine. But generally, uh, an, an answer is we are working already with MDBs on increased transparency requirements for every project. You know, I, and um, you know, uh, I think uh, Ukraine is historically currently lucky, you know, to have the, the leadership of the ministry like we have now, specifically in this moment, uh, and uh, especially even after the last, you know, the idea of them to merge and to really to make a center of competence in the ministry, but also with the Ministry of Digital, you know, which helps a lot. Uh, but also, and, and I, I really encourage those who, who are here who is planning to work with Ukraine, you know, on the reconstruction efforts, you know, to, to work with those ministries, but also with civil society, you know, which deals in a, in a, as a which makes a, a, a huge effort for the, not only oversight, which is an important part, but also to support and help, uh, you know, Ukrainian authorities to build the systems. Eka, you know, uh, what is your view? And maybe uh, we'll go back to the, to the nationals a little bit later now with John, but uh, the private money will go also to the to, for the reconstruction. Sure. Yeah. I and think. Mm -hmm. I, sorry, interrupt. No, no. It's, <laughs> uh, I'll combine some of it. I guess I mean going beyond the private in that sense, partially uh, broadening the perspective of what donors actually have been doing already in Ukraine, because the close engagement of donors for transfer in transformation and assisting transformation of Ukraine after the revolution of dignity has been already happening but from you know 2014 very extensively so it's not the situation when those who are well intended will come in to help Ukraine now without knowing what to do and then what Ukraine represents i mean you said uh, about me that you see my, me as more ukrainian rather than foreigner and i do it myself but this is a reflection of not me personally but of so many of us that have been working shoulder to shoulder with our Ukrainian friends and colleagues for years in Ukraine for transformation of Ukraine. So what we, what we do already and have been doing in Ukraine is bringing capacity for Ukrainians, for them to have the capacity to do what they have been doing over the years, whenever it was needed, with whatever means was needed, and then to stand with them defending the achievements of reforms when vested interests were fighting about on, on those achievements, because no transformation goes easy in any country. You have progress and you have setbacks because those who have interests to fight back, they do, and they are powerful. So in that regard, actually in Ukraine, and I'm saying that as a person that was 
again, in the government of Georgia for 10 years, and that we knew how coordination of donors was an issue for so many years, it's unprecedented in Ukraine how coordinated donors and technical assistance projects are in this case. And I can say that, again, from the beginning of the, uh, of the aftermath of the Revolution of Dignity, U.S. government invested in every sectoral development, including anti-corruption. So what we see now as a resilience of the country, which is attributed to Ukrainians themselves, it was partially at least a reflection of all the capacities that were bought to the country and continue to do. And part, I guess, what Ukraine represents now as a, again, a special case, it's from both sides how Ukrainians themselves did it and created that special precedent and how donors did it differently as well in Ukraine because all of it that we are talking now management systems, digital tools, capacities for the guys like Viktor, Andre now to have whole coalition being built, we provide those capacities for that to happen. For that not only to be funded, but then to be partnering in the developments like that. So what we need to be doing to stay agile and committed in this direction. I don't believe in concentrated single instruments or tools that could deliver it all because Ukraine is just too large for that and it will not contribute for sustainable development of the country. So we need to do what we have been doing but with more agility to it in terms of capacity development of the Ukraine institutions, both state at the central level, at the uh, sub-national level, municipalities, bringing all the capacity that is needed for the civil society to be as creative and agile as they have been over the years to exercise monitoring and evaluation uh, functions as well, and then to consolidate our own thinking on conditionalities that might be attached, not only for my advice, but for the donors as well, to assistance that will be delivered so that conditionalities, as they have done previously, serve further development of Ukraine as a country in a sustainable way, rather than are just mechanisms of pushing uh, or controlling uh, with uh, lack of confidence that Ukrainians themselves would do that. Now, one important element is to ensure that during the reconstruction and rebuilding, no new vested interests are emerging in the country. And a lot of institutional and structural reforms need to be done in this direction for the prevention of corruption including through the institutions that have lagged behind so far when it comes to the structural reforms in accounting and, and in auditing services and then areas that need to be more developed. It's a good time to start already to demand, to recommend, to request, have friendly approaches on that and resources delivered so that before the large-scale reconstruction at that level starts, they are already beefed up in the way that they could actually take on more rather than they could be trusted to do now in this direction. And finally, and again, I look at it through the prism how state need to deal with the development. It's a social cohesion when the shooting stops that needs to be maintained. For that state needs to deliver quicker because people need to rebuild their lives. So private business is key for that and trust in investment environment. And for that, then ownership and leadership needs to be with the Ukrainian side to give then project the image what type of economy Ukraine will be building. Will it be based on the liberal economic sort of viewpoint or, uh, and this is something that needs to be well channeled through the reforms as well when it comes to system of taxation, when it comes to the customs, when it comes to judiciary, uh, so that when it comes to private investors or lenders being able uh, and interested to begin with to invest in the bouncing back of Ukrainian economy, they would trust in the trajectory of economic policy views. In Georgia at the time, we specially created, uh, adopted a law, Economic Freedom Act at the time, that sent the message that even if the governments will change in Georgia, nobody could increase taxes freely and voluntarily. There was a requirement even of a referendum at the time for any substantial increase of taxes that uh, could have been enacted for one simple reason, so that investors wouldn't think that, okay, these guys are more for the regulated economy, but maybe there will be others that will completely uh, change it and then make it overly regulated and then, you know, completely different economic policies. Businesses think long term. They have to have a return rate that is appealing to them. And we need to be contributing for that as well. What we prioritize what type of reforms in different sectors need to be instituted so that economy itself is appealing through rule of law, uh, through 
uh, economic policies and then readiness of, of, of the labor and capacity of Ukrainians to fill in for the economic development. Thanks, Eka. I, I said that uh, you are Ukrainian, you know, I, it's fully recognized that you are from Georgia, you know, <laughs> but we believe you are Ukrainian, like I also see Giza there, he's a friend of mine, you know, who is, who is here, is uh, also, you know, we already perceive as Ukrainian, you know. I will ask later Alexander to reflect what, what, what is said, you know, by others, but John, you know, from the bilaterals, uh, you know, really like from nations, you know, we'll have money from donors' money, you know, the not, not only credits, now we have from European Union, we receive more loans, macrofinancial system is a loan, even on the conceptual terms. From US, we receive more donor, uh, the, the grants, which is clearly more preferred, uh, especially now in the in these uh, current circumstances. But still, how to decrease both on demand and supply side for Ukraine and reconstruction? You know, what are the lessons you could say now to decrease the corruption? I'm sorry. Uh, I think the important thing, and I hate to use a phrase that you've, you've probably heard a hundred times at uh, Transparency International conferences, is the, the phrase, follow the money. Uh, whether it's a, a bilateral uh, assistance or multilateral assistance, whether it's a, a, a on budget assistance, which I, I think many donors are nervous about because you really lose uh, control of the money once it goes to the central bank or the uh, Ukrainian government. Uh, it's, you got to follow the money. And that means y you, you have to have a system in place. And I'm speaking now from a donor's point of view. I mean, the, the U.S. Congress should be asking these questions, and they will. And all of the parliaments will. You know, we gave X millions of dollars, however it was given, and it was for X purpose, did it accomplish it? Uh, I remind my staff and many people we brief on the Hill and the administration, uh, oversight agencies like SIGAR look at inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Inputs is how much money we send in. Well, the U.S. government, unfortunately in Afghanistan, we didn't even know how much money we were spending. Uh, when I started 12 years ago, there was no central database. I'm glad we have that now. And we definitely didn't know how much money the rest of the countries were spending. That's an input, but usually they'll count that. Outputs, well, okay, we gave you money to build so many kilometers of road, how many kilometers did you build? Well, there was an outcome you also, what was the objective of building those roads? And that was to help the economy, or the railroad was to move something, and, or if you gave weapons, it was to you know, fight the war. Oversight agencies and parliaments and congresses aren't really good at grabbing data on what was the eventual outcome. And that will be something I think you really got to focus on. So when I talk about follow the money, I don't mean that the money went to a contractor, that went to a subcontractor. That's important. But also what was accomplished by it. And I think you have to keep that in mind because Congress will keep you in mind. And, and let me just back up. I'm not opposed to what's going on in Ukraine. I think that's another thing to keep in mind also. You, on the oversight side, will be accused at some point, if you haven't been accused already, of not supporting the Ukrainian effort. Or, worse, that you're slowing down the weapons going to the Ukrainian forces or the reconstruction. And I think that's something to keep in mind, too. Good oversight is good government. And good a government means Ukrainians win the war and they rebuild their country. But mark my word, you and the civil society will be accused of hampering, and I think it's false, hampering the effort. You and the criminal courts will be accused. And you're going to be faced with a dilemma like we were of indicting U.S. military officers or indicting major contractors for corruption or kickbacks and being accused that we were slowing down the effort. So please keep that in mind. And that's why I keep going back to the timeline. Your timeline in the Ukraine on the ground is going to be different than the timeline of the donors. And you have to remind them of that. 
Reconstruction takes time. One of the colleagues said, what, 10 years or a decade or a generation? It's going to take that long. So you need this effort to keep going constantly. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Sasha. I just recently learned that the victory in Korean, the hieroglyph, is transcripted as infrastructure, basically. That was a very important finding for me, because Ukrainian victory is a victory of the democratic state, of the market economy, and of the really decentralized system. We really do have a fight of different systems. And the victory of Ukraine will be not only the ceasefire, it will be again about the reestablishment of whole institutions that to make sure that all things we are fighting for now will be functionable. I would like to ask a question. How many of you can control the temperature in your apartment or house during the winter period? Please raise your hand. O opening the windows is not controlling, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in planned economy, such USSR, you hadn't possibility to control the temperature in your apartment. The state is deciding that you will have 20, 22, 24 degree. During the last 10 years, Ukraine was fighting for our independence, even in our own apartments. We just started to build housings where your proper way to actually be more environmentally friendly, you know, to have your bill a bit smaller. In Russia, they still open in windows. The things they're doing now against our energy system, the things they're doing against our way of society are terrible. That's actually war crimes. But again, we will not just build better. We will use our former weaknesses as our strength. Yes, we're young. I'm the same age as Ukraine. But we do have quite long history, which led us to the situation when we had historically very weak institutions, but very strong horizontal connections. And that's why we're so resilient. And we're going to use that in our reconstruction efforts. There are a lot of ways to do it properly. We're going to talk about direct democracy. We're going to talk about different things. But again, I think that's something which we're going to learn the world as well. Remind why do we need societies? Why do we need state as it is? And coming back to your question, how to make sure that the support of Ukraine will be sustainable. Because from what I feel here in the US, it seems like it's, it's more about you know, values and emotions. And you really, like, I think Americans like Ukrainian even storytelling, because there are not so many you know, pragmatic reasons. That's really about understanding of our fight. But for the future and reconstruction efforts in Ukraine, we need two main things. And we are starting to work on this already. First, we need our partners to believe in us because economy basically is the trust. Do we trust in our currency? Do you trust in Ukraine? Are you ready to invest there? That's about it. And that's why we need to be not only open, transparent and accountable, but we need to work together to be involved. And the second thing which really connected to what I'm saying I really want to go from the donor-recipient connection to the partnership. I know it's hard. We're very dependent. It's obvious that we wouldn't sustain without your direct microfinancial support or, you know, like a weapon supplies. That's obvious. But still, we're grown-ups. And let's find a ways to be more useful, more interesting to each other. That's the base. Thank you. The minister, I, I fully agree with you. You know, this is. Uh, I think the West already believes that Ukraine will win. This was not the case uh, in the first months of the war. Now they, we, we need to build uh, the trust uh, that we will be able, you know, to have to own our reconstruction with all the lessons learned from other countries and our own mistakes as well. I'm sure, uh, and we need to go this path together. I fully agree with you as partners. More, more of our 
I personally saying that this is not only about the donors, uh, because we will not be able to rebuild the country using donor money. We will be able to rebuild the country using the private money, and for this uh, we need to, to show, to demonstrate, uh, and we need to make sure that the world will believe and trust uh, that Ukraine is the next big thing in the world, the, our reconstruction. And this is a big opportunity also for Ukrainians, uh, who will clearly to come back, uh, also to Ukrainian business, but also to the, the other countries in the world, uh, you know, European, uh, Canadian, Turkish, British, American, uh, you know, the Middle East, uh, uh, South Asia, people should be able to come to us and we should show the, 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 the opportunity and clearly, you know, the getting out of the Soviet legacy, as you said, there is a great uh, war that we have, uh, you know, reconstruction, revolution in our apartments and uh, for our independence. This is a, a strong statement, you know. But uh, let's go, I mean, we don't have so much time now, and I want to have a few questions from the audience. Uh, but, uh, Victor, um, Rice, can you please tell something about the, the Rice initiative in general, about the building the, the, the system? Uh, uh, and uh, the, um, mm, uh, because uh, clearly the, the, mm, the uh, accountability framework which we need to build in order to build this trust, which Sasha was saying, is, uh, I mean, includes many things, starting from damage assessment, and you go to prioritization, we've already said this, strategizing, you know, planning, including midterm planning, you know, capacity building, also the minister was saying about that, and Eka was saying about that. Uh, we need to go through the procurement, and uh, uh, Andrei was also saying about that. Uh, you know, so we, I mean, clearly, and, uh, and oversight, what John was saying, we already discussed that, uh, an evaluation uh, of the project, which also John was just saying, what we want to achieve in our outcomes, uh, what uh, you are currently, you know, building, you know, also, and uh, what, what I missed in my, in, in my words now. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, uh, we did our homework, and together with uh, Rise Ukraine members, which is a coalition of uh, non-governmental organizations that works really closely with the government of Ukraine, with multiple ministries, including Ministry of Infrastructure, former Ministry of Communities and Territories Development, Accounting Chamber, and so on. So first of all, what we did, we analyzed uh, actually SIGAR uh, reports, lessons learned from, from Afghanistan, and many, many other papers. So uh, Kyiv School of Economics uh, helped us with that, Prozoro sale. And overall, we collected a lot of insights from previous disaster and reconstructions and made a concept that actually what could help us to make this reconstruction much, much better is end-to-end -end digitalization. Disasters and reconstructions, not disasters yeah, yeah. slash reconstructions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so end-to-end um, -end digitalization uh, will help us because 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there was not an opportunity to collect data and make fast, proper data-driven decisions. Now we have that opportunity. So with, with public procurement, for example, there is an open contracting data standard that supports that. Uh, with uh, a lot of other elements, uh, there are uh, a lot of other pieces that actually help us to understand whether to build these two schools or whether to build that 100 kilometers of, of, of roads. So from very beginning, uh, we are in close cooperation, as said, with Ministry of Infrastructure and with Ministry of Communities and Territories Development, which is now basically one ministry of reconstruction of yeah. Ukraine, uh, we've been working on a concept that helps to link every particular project from damages assessment to actually commissioning and even operation and maintenance. And in this pass, we're talking about uh, several stages. So first, when we understand what is destroyed, we have to make smart decisions based on data, based on you know, migration data, based on education, healthcare, based on air pollution even, and, and many other data pieces uh, with advanced geo-informational system um, to actually understand whether we need to build the school here, and if so, when we have to build the school, whether we can wait uh, until the next year, because, for example, some basic stuff is not yet ready, like electricity or, or water supply, right? So, first of all, this data-driven approach will help us to, to make better decisions and to prioritize projects. So, eventually, we're not talking about infrastructure and premises, but we're talking about outcomes. How many people have access to proper health care? How many people has, have access to proper education and so on? Once we've uh, done this exercise, we are coming actually to 
uh, general project cycle, you know, and uh, we are not inventing the wheel. We are following international uh, methodologies and everything starts with project definition, project appraisal, project structuring, tender preparation, obviously uh, raising funds. And when we're talking about uh, projects and financing with MDBs, they are not ready to give us money, you know, here is $10 billion, implement whatever you, you want. It will be project by project support, right? And we will be implementing schools, we will be implementing roads and so on, and the system there we, we are now designing and developing will actually help us to show that every particular infrastructure project is linked to those outcomes. Uh, financial requests are justified. We're not talking about, you know, 750 billions in general, but we're talking about, you know, 10 billions next year, let's say. And here is the list of projects that we are ready and we are capable to implement because our absor absorption capacity that could also be tracked using the same system, you know, based on previous uh, experience is sufficient to implement that. And um, eventually, after we have all this, you know, menu of projects, uh, we will be able to use the system to better coordinate international support. So there is no uh, double funding, and uh, if there is a case, then, for example, a hospital in Zhitomir is already supported by uh, government of, of, of Estonia, uh, we are not raising funds from World Bank for the same hospital, and every particular person can check this fact using this digital uh, system. And eventually, after procurement is conducted, you know, in this system we will be able to track every milestone of the project. So, uh, whether foundation has already been built, whether uh, we've already paid, uh, you know, in, enough money for that, and so on. So, again, end-to-end -end digitalization. Uh, this is not a dream. We already have a technical concept uh, that we developed together with the Ministry of Infrastructure. On December 20th, by the way, we will have a presentation. Uh, so uh, follow RISE and Ministry of Infrastructure in social medias. Uh, you will be able to, to uh, look it in, in details. And we truly believe that this system will not just help to better manage the projects, but it will help us to create an open ecosystem that will provide access to open data about every particular project and will help and will incentivize you know, civic tech, will incentivize private sector, you know, marketplaces that will be promoting tender opportunities for companies in Ukraine and abroad. Uh, civil society will develop red flag system. They will be able to record and monitor whether, you know, this particular hospital is actually meeting the schedule of, of its implementation and so on. So it's about the culture and about the shift. And we really believe that this approach will help to make Ukraine a role model of open government and open contracting for the rest of the world to also inspire other nations to be more open, you know, to increase trust between citizens and governments, because we have a huge problem with that. And eventually, just last remark, I, I believe that, you know, how many of you perceives Ukraine as a post-Soviet country? No. I see, I, I see some hands, but um, how many of you perceive Estonia as post-Soviet country? Right, so <laughs> less, less hands. The problem is Estonia is now European nation. It's European state. Ukraine is often perceived as post-Soviet legacy, somehow linked to Russia. We have to win this reconstruction to forget about that. Ukraine is Ukraine. It's an independent, developed state, and we have to modernize Ukraine to build a dream and inspiration for the rest of the world. And I hope that we will be talking about post-Russia countries in a year. Ukraine is also a candidate to become a part of the EU. And Andre, is uh, probably the, the last question, and I think maybe one, two questions from the audience, yeah? The, uh, Transparency International, did, as I said, did a lot in, in, in Ukraine, and uh, still there is a perception of the country of, of a corruption. What Transparency International is planning to do to, the, to for in Ukraine, this, this uh, perception will go down, and what is your estimation or a guess uh, where the Ukraine will be in uh, 2013 Transparency International Index? Yeah, these questions about... Uh, After, I mean, during steel reconstruction, as you said, uh, it will take a generation. Um, I'm like, like these questions about what will be the index, because uh, just to know that TI chapters around the globe do not measure the corruption perception index in their countries. This is done by other organizations, 
dot, that's it. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, we truly believe that the transparency uh, of the like processes within which are within the government, whether it's public procurement or any other, is one, one, one of the key steps for preventing the corruption. Uh, the second one, of course, if the corruption is still... So it's much harder to do to prevent the corruption because you need to forecast uh, where it can be and, and do all the work. That's why there is like lots of efforts and need to be paid exactly to this. But then if it's happened, there should be a punishment for this. For this, we already have anti-corruption infrastructure in Ukraine, and uh, which was built with the help of the donors and international partners at the political level as well for the last eight years. And Ukraine, within the Corruption Perception Index, is one out of 25 countries for the last uh, 10 years who have a considerable positive results in fighting the corruption. So it means that other 90% of the countries around the globe don't have progress or have decreased uh, in, in the index. And honestly, including the US, if to be very honest. Uh, so we will continue our work. We will be like partnering with other CSOs, partnering with the government. We were doing this many times before and uh, exactly this like co-creation is one of the principles for the open government partnership, but it's also one of the principles of us. Uh, so we will continue doing this, but still answering your question about the CPI, I look at CPI comparing like the Ukraine's 32 points and the average uh, within the EU, which is 51. So I would say that during the reconstruction, after the reconstruction, yeah, it should be at least at the level of the average within the EU, um, which it is now. So like t plus 20 points would, would be great, but it all depends on all of us, not only in Ukraine, but also outside of Ukraine on the donor coordination. And about this, my, my last point, because in Ukraine, I'll be honest, not always donors co uh, coordinating, but when they do, we receive amazing results. And that's what like, all Ukrainians, foreigners need to remember when they come in or, or they're already working in the country. So coordination of all of us and uh, not looking at the world as black and white because it's always gray will help us to uh, achieve the success. Looks like a toast, you know, so for the, for, for the, for the coordination of... Uh, and I'm Ukrainian, I'm not Georgian. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, the, for, the, for the coordination and uh, for the, 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 the transparency in the index, you know, and we, ha we can put it in the, in the system to monitor, you know, I would say. Let's have a few questions, if possible. You know, sir, you know, there could be a mic. Thank you. Um, thank you for a brilliant presentation, and I'm sure that everyone in the room has huge solidarity for the immense and amazing work you're doing. I guess one criticism of the, the, the conference generally is some of the sessions have been more about corruption than about anti-corruption. I'd say this one has been great on the anti-corruption, but um, in terms of the, the risks, um, the minister mentioned you know, the wrong choice of cement, and we heard about uh, the, the risk of new vested interests emerging. And I just wondered um, when, so I, I'm Peter Evans, I, I'm the director of the U4 Anti-Corruption Resource Center, and we have to advise our bilateral um, funding partners on um, things like corruption risk management and also political, um, the political dimensions of uh, reconstruction funding in, in Ukraine. I wondered if you could say a little more about um, what the, the biggest risks and threats and who the real bad guys you fear will be and what um, the opposite of success might look like. Because I'm fully with you on everything that has been said. We've had some criticism of the donors, which I fully agree with. But I just wondered a bit more on the, uh, what, what does worry you about the, the political risks of corruption in reconstruction in Ukraine. Thank you. Sasha Thank you very much. We have 450 MPs in the country. I do afraid them, first of all, because they have a right to come to our cabinet anytime. And I wish to have someone from the anti-corruption body sitting with me at each of those meetings. Really, my desire. For sure, we are all for like decentralization and for sure we cannot build it properly without their engagement. But there are so many interesting lesions in there, even more interesting than in the capital. So for sure, with the digitalization, that's not enough. Anti-corruption infrastructure, that's what matters. And even more of that, that's human resources. We are in discussions now with different partners now, 
how to involve our veterans in for the anti-corruption fight. I want those people who now are fighting for Ukraine to come back and to have not the weapons in their hands, but you know, like constitution and real possibility to change the country. They will have the best support in the society for sure. And I clearly understand that we don't have this mood for, you know, like some kind of military governance after the war in Ukraine. No, that's not going to happen. But I, I want them to be part of this anti-corruption fight because at least someone need to be with us. Because frankly speaking, the people in the government are quite vulnerable as well in here. Thank yeah, you. What, what, Eka, what, what Eka said before is, uh, uh, I mean, believe me, there will be more donors who will come, not only those who work in Ukraine, there will be more vested interest who wants to be a vested interest, you know, in the, in the reconstruction and what the minister just said, uh, this is very important in order to also to, to protect the government uh, from, all, from all them. And again, there will be a demand for the, from the supply side corruption and, uh, you know, pushing for the, some specific contractors probably. And this is what Victor was saying, the transparency is so important also for, for that. John, do you have anything to add? Uh, I, I would add, uh, when I was in Afghanistan, we were basically were chasing uh, ghosts, gas, and gangsters. 50% uh, of the Afghan military didn't exist and we paid their salaries. So you have to make certain that there are salaries. I mean, we even, schools that didn't exist, we were just, it was all ghosts. Uh, 50% of the gas, and we were providing over a billion dollars a year in gasoline to the Afghans, and we got our government to admit that over 50% disappeared. So, and gangsters. Basically, the oligarchs controlled the funding, and so that comes, I would definitely watch that and the subcontractors, and the other thing is, you really have to have a very strong anti-money laundering component. And so we have what we call FinCEN in the United States, uh, Financial Crimes Intelligence Network. You really need that because the money, particularly if you're spending as much money as the donors are giving you, there's going to be spillage and it's going to be leaving your country. So you got to watch that. So that was a, I'd keep that in mind. Andre. Um, I'll be brief, just compliment to Sasha that 415 MPs, I, I call it like a political influence and extensive political influence on what, when and how what need to be rebuilt. Uh, this will be just a disaster. Uh, and the second one um, is actually the capacity. Uh, let's be honest, there is much less people in Ukraine than it was before this full-scale invasion and the quality of the people is also now different and we need to think about that because at some point we will not have enough of capacity and uh, low quality people will come with other views on how, how need and what to be done and finally we can result in uh, like corruption at, 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 um, at the local, for example, yeah, situations. So the capacity and the political influence are two, I would say, main, main risks uh, for, for the future reconstruction. What you, what, what you named the uh, political influence in some countries is named democracy. <laughs> uh, but I, I understand what, what Sasha said, I uh, fully, fully subscribe for that. Sure. Um, uh, what we haven't talked that much is the, what, what happens with the bottom-up approach. And then here I mean uh, society at large, not just civil society, which is part of society, but society which has suffered so much, right, in Ukraine. Those who are internally displaced, those who are refugees, and then those who are just suffering in their own habitual places of residence, right? And then you have that momentum of uh, un unprecedented consolidation. When through that horizontal connectivity now, nobody would ever question what happens with that strength right of consolidation but at the same time we need to understand that the, when the war stops it lasts for some time but then life comes in and then it's very hard to have that degree of consolidation maintained it's all natural that there will be differences of the view some disillusionment that will happen in different communities so what you do from the day one and plan for that so that all the data planning transparently that is easier absorbable for those who are developed for that, are motivated to be part of monitoring and evaluation of business communities, how you relate that as a storytelling and inclusion into that process, larger portions of the society. Veterans is just one example for them to be part of that, but others, because ultimately the biggest 
deterrence for influencing and manipulating from the vested interest or from the political actors with bad intentions, the process is, is to have as much as possible understanding and alignment of the bigger portion of society with, with the processes. And if you look, and we've researched a lot different examples of the crisis management situations, disasters, post-conflict situations, social cohesion becomes then the biggest problem because communities are not consulted about their future because there is this dilemma. Too much of a horizontal consultation delays the process, but the lack of that endangers sustainability of the progress. So how you draw the middle line so that all the progress that Ukraine already had of civic engagement is not evaporating with that argument of quick delivery, because you have to deliver quickly, but other than that, we need to be attentive to that as well, to maintain that. Thanks, Eka. And, uh if you allow me, we will, we will stop here. You know, we were having we had a one and a half hours, which flight very, very fast. Uh, as probably, you know, the, the generation will last, will fly very fast, as you said. Uh, you know, uh, while clearly every hour in Ukraine now matters. And uh, we don't need to waste this time. And uh, what John was saying, what all of you were saying. Uh, after today, you know, panel, I'm more optimistic even. Uh, uh, even though uh, when we speak about the anti-corruption today, we were speaking mostly about the reconstruction, which means infrastructure, and we have a minister here representing the, the reconstruction, I mean, the infrastructure part, uh, but uh, I personally don't like very much the word reconstruction or recovery, and what, what Eka was saying just also now, we need to speak more about modernization of the country and the transformation of the country after the war, because it's a, a lot about the social fabric uh, to be rebuilt, uh, and, uh, but I'm, a po I'm optimistic uh, uh, that we will manage it, uh, and we will follow what Andre was saying as a target for us, you know, to go in terms of the perception also of the, uh, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the corruption, despite the fact that absolutely sure we will face also our own ghosts, uh, you know, the um, uh, gas and, uh, uh, and gangsters. Uh. But again, I'm positive that we will manage it because we have both strong institutions which clearly will become stronger during the reconstruction. There is no way, you know, no, uh, we cannot waste this uh, opportunity. And because we have also the strong civil society, not only from oversight, but also professional uh, civil society, which, uh, as you see today, you know, is very complementary to the government work uh, and uh, bringing the, the most modern solutions. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I was a uh, one day in 2015, I invented the name Prozoro in Ukraine, uh, and I do hope that RISE will be a new name for the, you know, for Ukrainian reconstruction, you know, platforms because it will be a RISE of Ukraine. And uh, as uh, we have here, you know, Alexei Soboli from Prozoro Sale, as uh, Victor was saying about the Prozoro system uh, award, global awards in the world, uh, I'm sure we will read uh, about the Ukrainian experience not only in the type of the seagull reports with a lot of mistakes and lessons learned and uh, also from donors and uh, and uh, the nation uh, ukrainians mistakes uh, but clearly as the lessons learned for the world uh, as you said how to do, to make the world more transparent more open uh, and hopefully this will be used our experience much less in the world because of will be less wars and less natural disasters but as we know, unfortunately, our experience will be needed more. Thanks a lot for all of you to participate. <laughs>